Hello everybody, what's going on? This is Andrew, and today I want to take a look at Pioneer and how Streets of New Capenna could influence the Pioneer metagame. So I made a sort of list of five decks that I think have pretty obvious cards to look for and upgrades they could potentially make from Streets of New Capenna. This is by no means a top five strongest cards from New Capenna list, this isn't like these cards are the best cards from the format. I think that these five decks get pretty obvious cards that they should try out and see if they're better than what they're currently doing. I don't know if they are better or not, but I think they could be. So I'm gonna dive in to five decks that I think get pretty good upgrades in New Capenna. But before I start, I'm going to on give an honorable mention to these five cards, uh, Knockout Blow, Out of the Way, Whack, Torch Breath, and Bouncer's Beatdown are all cards that do better if they're targeting an enemy color. Um, cards like this are usually pretty good and they're usually worth keeping your eye on. Uh, I think Whack and Knockout Blow are the two that immediately stand out to me as, as pretty, pretty good in Pioneer, but all five of these cards are cheap in the right circumstances and will probably find homes and sideboards all across Pioneer and Standard at one point or another. Just wanted to draw attention to these cards. They're simple, they're powerful, and you should probably put try them out in your sideboards in certain Pioneer decks. So now that that honorable mention is out of the way, let's get into the first deck, which is Mono Red. Um, I tried to play mono red in a tournament uh, recently and it didn't go particularly well for me, but people are putting up good results with versions of this deck. And I think this deck has a lot of staying power moving forward in the format. Um, you've, it's got a bunch of good one drops, good burn spells and bone crusher giant and great lands to go long. Um, the card that I think this deck could look to play, and I don't know if it should, but I think it could is strangle. Uh, Strangle is a one mana red sorcery that deals three damage to hurt target creature or planeswalker. Um, the fact that this doesn't go face might make it not playable in the Pioneer format, but any one mana three damage spell needs to be looked at for mono red decks. This mono red deck has a bunch of prowess creatures which want cheap spells so they can get pumped up so they can get attacking. Um, the fact that this deals with other problematic creatures in the format, like uh, Grease Fang, means that you know maybe it's maybe it's playable. Maybe this is this is something that we want to look at. That said, I'm not super sure how it fits in here. Um, the Wild Slashes you could maybe trim some. Maybe you cut a Chandra. I don't know if that's where you want to go. And like I said, I don't know if it's the perfect fit, but it's something to keep keep an eye on for sure. Uh, moving on to the next deck. Uh, the blue-white control deck. Um, this deck, you know, plays a lot of cheap removal, cheap counter magic, uh, some sweepers, and then some planeswalkers to win the game. And decks like this are usually popular um, and present in deeper formats. And this deck has a lot of cool stuff going for it. Like I said, really efficient removal, really powerful planeswalkers and uh, a pretty straightforward win condition once you get going with uh, Teferi Hero of Dominaria and Castle Ardenvale making creature tokens to actually win you the game. So where do I think this deck could go from here? Well, it's a little different than you might think. Um, the new set, Streets of Nuka Pennant, introduced a couple multicolor cards that overlap in white-blue but add an extra color. Both of these cards, I think, are powerful enough that you might want to look at splashing either green or black, have access to these cards, and going into e either of those three color pairs, or three color triomes, I guess, gets you access to a charm that is, is playable also. So first, let's look at Endless Detour, a green-white-blue instant that says the owner of target spell, non-land permanent, or card in a graveyard puts it on the top or bottom of their library. This is a really, really, really flexible card that I think some control decks would be really, really happy to have. It's not a straight counter, 
but the fact that they have to choose whether to time walk themselves and put it back on top of their deck or put it in their graveyard, it can hit a permanent so it's better in some ways than a counter spell because you can deal with something that's on the battlefield and you can also rebuy good cards in your graveyard or take cards away from their graveyard. This is a super flexible card and could be worth going into green to get access to. If you go this way, you can also play the three color, the three color land that was just, that's going to be released in this set um, in place of these irrigated farmlands. And I think the mana gets kind of easy to do. If you go into green, you get access to Broker's Charm if you want it. Um, you can give a creature plus one plus zero, oh, and then have it fight a creature or planeswalker. You can blow up an enchantment, or you can draw two cards. Control decks like drawing two cards. So holding up three mana, and then just drawing two on end step instead of casting a counter spell, something that control decks are often interested in doing. Again, I don't know if Broker's Charm is worth it, but I think Endless Detour, definitely worth it. And since you're going here, you might as well consider Broker's Charm. Similar thing with black. If we go into black, we get Void Red. This spell can't be countered and it destroys an online permanent. A little expensive, but it gets the job done and it kills whatever you need to be killed. Pretty good in mirror matchups or in matchups where your opponent is uh, kind of attacking fast and using counter magic to protect their stuff. And again, if we're going into black for Void Red and using the three color land, uh, the Obscura land, then we get access to Obscura Charm if we want it. We can return a multicolored permanent with mana value three or less from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped. We can counter an instant or sorcery, or we can destroy a creature planeswalker with mana value three or less. All good modes, all good modes for a control deck. Um, this deck doesn't have any multicolored cards to get back in the first mode in this build, but there are cards sometimes that this deck will play that they would want to get back. Going into black for Voidrend might convince these decks to play more black, which might end up being good for them, right? You get access to Thought Seize, you get access to other cards like that. Um, it's a good time to be a control player in Pioneer, I think, because I think you have a lot of options in this next set. The mana is going to be excellent and you can kind of go in any direction you want to go in. Moving on to the Naya Winota deck. Um, if you haven't seen this deck before, it uses Winota, Joiner of Forces, which is a 4-mana four 4-4 four that says whenever a non-human creature attacks, look at the top of your deck, the top six cards of your deck, I think, for a human, and then put the human into play tapped and attacking with Indestructible this turn. So this deck plays Elvish Mystic and Lana War Elves and Prosperous Innkeeper, which are non-human mana dorks, to ramp you into Winota, and then after you are attacking with all of these dorks with Winota out, you get to get things like Brutal Cathar, Tovalar's Huntmaster, and Kenrith the Returned King to hopefully help you win the game very, very quickly. The deck also gets to play cards like Elite Spellbinder in the sideboard. It's, it's a powerful deck, um, and it's explosive and can just kill you out of nowhere. Streets of Nukapenna has this card Mage's Attendant, a 3-mana three 3-2 three Cat Rogue that says when it comes into when it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one blue wizard creature token with one sacrifice this creature, counter target non-creature spell unless its controller pays one. So this is a 3-mana creature that's not a human that creates a blue wizard creature token that's also not a human that then can protect your Winota when it comes down the following turn or in turns after that. Um, I don't know if the Winota decks want a card like this right now, but if at any point in the future they're getting blown up by, you know, whatever, anything but Supreme Verdict, you want Mage's Attendant. This card seems like a great anti-control sideboard card. You could maybe sneak a copy in the main deck if you really wanted to, because it makes two creatures for Winota. So like the worst case scenario is now you have a 3-2 and a 1-1, that can start attacking your opponent. And if you ever find the Winota, that's two triggers on your Winota. Seems great to me. Seems like a pretty straightforward card to talk about. I don't really have anything more to say. Keep this card in mind if you're a Winota player, I think. Um, next up, we have Mono Black, 
When the format started, Mono Black was one of the pillars of the format. It played Smuggler's Copter because the card wasn't banned yet, and it was really, really strong. You get Thoughtseize, you get Fatal Push, you get a bunch of good one drops. This deck seems great. It's kind of fallen off a little bit, but I do think that there are a couple cards from Nuka Penna that could help put this deck back on the map. Uh, the first card, and I think a lot of people had the same thought when they saw this card, Tenacious Underdog. Two mana, three two. It has Blitz. So for four mana and pay two life, you can cast the spell for its Blitz cost. It gains haste, and when this creature dies, draw a card. You sacrifice this at the beginning of the next end step, so you always get to draw a card after, at the end of the turn after you Blitz this thing. You may cast it from your graveyard using its Blitz ability. So if we go back to this mono blacklist, this deck already has a lot of graveyard recursion. We've got the Dread Wanders, the Scrap Heap Scroungers, the Blood Soaked Champions. We're already using the graveyard quite a bit to get value. So I think that the Tenacious Underdog just plays in pretty well there. It's another two and a three two. It draws you cards later on in the game. I think it just kind of fits in nicely with what a lot of this deck is doing anyways. But it doesn't really solve the deck's problems necessarily. Um, you're, you're still going to get Rest in Peace boarded in, boarded in against you, and this tenacious underdog isn't going to help solve those problems. But it gives you another option when building your deck. Maybe we can, you know, not play the Graveyard Trespassers and get a little smaller. Maybe the, the Rankles, we, we cut Rankles because we just want to get lower to the ground. So yeah, I think that the Tenacious Underdog gives the Mono Black deck another angle to look at when building your deck, when, you know, attacking. 2 mana 3 two is good, three, recursive 3 mana, 2 mana 3 two is great. A 4 mana 3 two with haste that draws you a card when it dies is also great. I think the card's good, I think it slots in here pretty well. Moving on to the last deck that I think picks up something big from the new set. It's this Rakdos Sacrifice deck, and I think the card I'm thinking of is a card that lots of people have already identified that goes in this deck. It is Ob Nixilis, the adversary. So we'll get back to Ob Nixilis in a second. This Rakdos Sacrifice deck plays a bunch of cheap creatures, it plays the Cat Oven combo, it plays Oni Cult Anvil, and it just like churns through its deck sacrificing stuff for a little bit of value here and there until all of a sudden it has a Mayhem Devil or a Meat Hook Massacre and it starts really sacrificing stuff to just drain you out of the game completely. Um, decks like this often look kind of underpowered when you just look at the cards, but it really relies on the synergy that the deck has to offer with the really efficient removal spells to just spin its wheels and just kind of kill you. It's a really powerful deck, don't underestimate this deck. And I think gaining a card like Obnixilis is potentially really scary or really exciting, depending on what side of the matchup you're on. So Obnixilis the Adversary is a three mana Planeswalker. It says plus one, each opponent loses two life unless they discard a card. If you control a demon or devil, you gain two life. It minus twos to create a one one devil token. And the devil token is the same as devil tokens we've seen in the past. When it dies, it deals the damage to any target. And then it's minus seven, says target player draws seven cards and loses seven life. It also includes the text Casualty X. The copy isn't legendary and has starting loyalty X. So as you cast this spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power X. When you do, copy the spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. So you can cast Obnixilis on turn three, sacrifice a creature you have lying around, and then you end up with two Obnixilis tokens that can just hang out and both exist on the battlefield at the same time. So let's come back to this deck. This deck already has creatures it wants to sacrifice pretty often. It's got the Voldaren Epicures, it's got the creatures from Onicult Anvil, it's got the Cauldron Familiars, all of which want to be sacrificed as often as possible. So Obnixilis just adds another power level to this deck that is just kind of silly. Um, most of the time you're gonna be sacrificing a one power creature. So you sack a one power creature, you get two up Nexuses. one is on three loyalty, one is on one loyalty. You can tick down the first one to make a double, and then you can tick up the second one 
to make them lose two life or discard a card, and then you gain two life. You can just send both ticking upwards to just start making your opponent lose a bunch of life and put the pressure on more. I think that this card is flexible. I think it pretty obviously fits in to what this deck is trying to do. I'm excited to see how this deck evolves and changes as the format evolves and as these new cards come out and people get their hands on the cards. And that's gonna be it for me. Um, I think Obnixilis is the most powerful of the options that I went over, but it's not the one I'm most excited about. I'm excited for basically everything else on this list. Um, I wanna see if the control decks switch a little bit to include Endless Detour or Voidrend. The Naya Winota deck is very exciting and I want to see if Major's Attendant can help it have some staying power. And Mono Black Aggro is a good deck and I want it to be able to exist. And I wonder if Tenacious Underdog and Whack can keep this deck relevant as the format continues to evolve. All that being said, that is going to be it for me for today. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me rant about new Capenna cards and how I think they might have an impact on Pioneer. Again, these aren't the most powerful cards, but I think these are the cards that most obviously slot into existing decks. I think that, you know, new archetypes might exist. That's not what this video was about. I just wanted to talk about some cool cards and how they might slot into decks that already exist. So thank you again for listening. I hope you enjoyed my rant. I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you on the streets of New Capenna.